Korea, Korea is one of the lowest, um, has one of the lowest wind and solar rates across um, uh, uh, across Asia. So, four percent of electricity in Korea comes from from wind and solar. Um, that compares against the ten percent globally. How do you get them on board that they're able and willing to step up to enable so much more grid connection, to enable so much more capacity into onto the onto the national grid to make that happen? Um, within Korea, there is. Um, uh, a lot of potential for fixed offshore but there's even more potential for floating offshore winds as well that, that's what makes me really really excited uh, that that level of um, possibility for Korea Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Tejun David Lee, a professor of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, uh, hosting the interview with an overseas expert uh, organized by Kenya. Uh, we will begin the uh, second part, the part two of the interview the, with Mr. Dave Jones, uh, the global program lead at Ember. Uh, we will continue our discussion on the global efforts toward carbon neutrality and the current status of the Republic of Korea. Uh, the first question, uh, Mr. Dave Jones, uh, the, were there any country that has shown outstanding progress uh, towards its carbon neutrality target? Uh, how would you compare its progress uh, the, to that of South Korea? Yeah, we, um, uh, when I'm, but we, the analysis that we did was specifically for the electricity sector. So I'll talk about it in context of, of the, the electricity transition. And, and what we what we thought was like an interesting benchmark was to go back to 2019 compared to 2021 to see uh, see how see the change in different countries and um, and see where the biggest changes had occurred in terms of their, their their electricity mix across the two years. And there were three countries that really stood out as the the biggest changes, which were uh, Netherlands, Vietnam. Um, and Australia, and um, and I just want to talk about each of them very quickly and the the, the kind of route that they're on with regards to their electricity transition. So, um, so uh, the first one is uh, within Australia. Um, when you look at Australia, you same as the US, you get really frustrated because it's all big conversations around the federal level and, um, uh, and and lack of progress but what is actually been happening on the ground and been happening on the ground for quite a long time now is this is this um has it started with a build-up of wind where some really good wind resources across australia um providing some really cheap electricity and then in the last in the last few years um a real real big step up in in solar as well some of that is from uh, utility scale solar a lot is from from rooftop solar and in the case of uh, in the case of Australia, has now seen a, a, a really, really big step up in, um, in, in especially of solar. What's also interesting is how much the um, that's actually starting already to replace not just coal generation, um, but also gas generation. In Netherlands, um, it's been a remarkable step up in um, in in solar generation, um, but also simultaneously in, in wind generation. In Vietnam, um, uh, it's seen an absolutely uh, mega step up in solar. One of the, uh, I think it was uh, number three last year for the, uh, sorry, previous year for the amount of solar panels installed within Vietnam. Vietnam have been on a path to really increasing its amount of coal generation. And rather than seeing coal generation rising, you'll now see coal generation falling, which are the feed-in tariffs that were, that, that helped finance that boom. Um, and uh, and since then, um, solar installation levels are, are much much lower. And you, you asked me to compare it against Korea. So in the last two years, those three countries that I mentioned had a tenth a tenth of their total electricity production was shifted from fossil to wind and solar. Just in two years, a tenth of their electricity production. Within um, Korea, Korea is one of the lowest um, has one of the lowest wind and solar rates across um, uh, uh, across Asia. So four percent of electricity in Korea comes from from wind and solar um, that compares against the 10% globally and and uh, the 10th of the electricity system in just in 
two years. So you can see how quick that transition can be when you make it happen, when you want to make it happen. But it's really about for career, there's so many lessons in there about how do you really try and block those barriers coming through. So in the in the way that you had um, in Vietnam, a, a problem with a system operator um, integrating that much wind and solar and being on board and doing the balancing for that within Korea, you obviously have a problem where KEPCO is the kind of uh, the, the, the monopoly system operator. How do you how do you get them on board that they're able and willing to step up to enable so much more grid connection to enable so much more capacity into onto the onto the national grid to make that happen let me ask you these questions that you are the researcher in the area of identifying and sharing best cases and the practices and the policies and the models uh, are there any best practice and models that korean society could refer to so um, uh, if you look at the, the case of the UK, it's quite, uh, quite an obvious one. We're an island nation. Um, we have a lot of coastline. We have a lot of good wind resources. Because of the way the government's done it with a, a stable pipeline of auctions, which have been keep increasing, it means the costs um, have been pretty cheap too. So the, the costs of offshore wind are, are really, really low. And when you look at, because of our resource in there, and trying to unpack some of that resource. And, um, and first, firstly, it was about having these fixed offshore wind turbines. Um, and now the UK government has also set up a task force and some it's put $200 million into, into research and development for floating wind. And within Korea, there is um, a lot of potential for fixed offshore, but there's even more potential for floating offshore wind as well, where there's there's some deeper coastline as well so um, when you look at um, the the potential numbers for that for for, for career it's huge for, for me it's going to be a, that that definitely offshore wind in total is going to be a massive um, sector it already is a massive sector I mean, even bigger sector going forward as as floating wind really starts to become um, a thing so that that's what makes me really really excited uh, that that level of um, possibility for Korea basically at the Korean society is paying more attention to uh, the role of the nuclear energy and the carbon neutrality uh, perspective uh, the what roles of nuclear energy could play in this regard uh, the countries like France and are placing nuclear energy at the heart of the country's drive for carbon neutrality uh, what is the rationale? some new nuclear plants they'll be replacing older nuclear plants that will be shutting but really France as much as any other country is also gonna is also um, gonna be building up its it's wind and solar it already has a tenth of its electricity from wind and solar within the mix for the France electricity transition it's not just about nuclear at all it's about um, maintaining the nuclear share of the mix um, or at least not letting it fall too much we know that electricity demand is going to pick up much faster so you so within France, it's really about meeting that extra electricity demand that's going to come through. Most of that is not going to be met with nuclear. Most of it, that extra electricity demand will be met with, with, with wind and solar. In the UK um, is, is, is another good example where, yeah, we're building Hinkley. Hinkley is, um, um, is going to provide, I think, 7% of the UK's electricity demand. It's a huge, huge project. The nuclear contract that we signed in the UK for Hinkley C was the same, was twice of the uh, level in a, it, it, at the same time as the, the the contract that was signed for offshore wind um, that came from the government off, uh, auction for offshore wind. So yeah, it will be an answer. Um, um, but um, please, like, let's not get into the big things about whether it's going to be the solution. It's not going to be the solution. Uh, the basically, so we are, are interested in as uh, knowing as uh, more about the strategies and the methods and approaches to uh, the making faster and the making stronger and the actions and achievement uh, for carbon neutrality goal. Uh, the, what is the most in, important and factor uh, that uh, the Korean society should uh, the take into account when reaching uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, the first one is the level of ambition. So, what level of ambition are you are you actually aiming for? So, um, are you on, is everyone on board with the forty percent by twenty thirty? Is that where you're aiming for? If it is, what does that mean for electricity? Can we have a plan for electricity? How uh, how are you going to meet that? What does that mean for electricity regarding the amount of clean electricity build up that's going to be needed? Where does that come from? What's the plan for actually stepping up on that? Because um, 
we've kind of the first phase of the electricity transition was uh, was trying to get some of those technologies a bit more mature get them starting be built up within the grid so you got wind and solar that are now four percent of of Korea's electricity and sure you can build a bit more and all of that um, but if you're really trying to go through with enough um, ambition to get to, to, to be on a one and a half degrees pathway the amount of speed um, and the scale of that transition is going to come so fast. You're going to hit all sorts of problems with that. So when you talk about what needs to happen from, from a policy side, the government needs to be going through and it needs to be working out where those, where those problems are going to be. So is it trying to get planning for, you know, even for offshore wind in Korea, there's planning concerns. Like how do you get rid of some of those planning concerns that enable fast tracking planning? How do you get the grid connections in there? So what's stopping the grid connections at the moment? Is it problems with KEPCO? Is it problems, like, is there, is there, is there another problem in the mix there? So, um, and, and, and all the way through, you have these problems, whether it's an import problem of different components, um, a land use problem, a grid integration problem, there's so many things in that whole mix that when a transition has got to happen so quickly, the government really needs to be on top for. And if you, the only way you can do that is really have a plan in mind for how quickly this is going to happen, that you work backwards. Within, when you look at the, the plans across the world at the moment, it, the UK and Germany are probably the only two countries that really have a... Um, an in-depth plan to decarbonize most of their electricity sector in terms of a roadmap for how they do that, um, an idea about how much auction is going to step up, how much auction volume is going to step up, getting the system operators really on board with uh, how to integrate that much and just a general appreciation of what it means within the economy. It requires so much planning and forethought for that. So, um, so uh, when, you know, at the, at the moment careers talk feels like it's almost at that first step you know what what ambition is it heading to it's not even at, at, at that point yet that you can articulate what it means for the electricity transition let alone try to work out you know how to unblock some of those barriers um so we're really in that 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 world where the governments have got to get their hands dirty with the details it's not just enough to give a you know a, a top line ambition and slowly work your way to it do you have any uh, last remarks on to this interview there was a really interesting um, announcement from the, the G7 two weeks ago where the climate ministers are now pledged to get to what they call predominantly um, um, clean electricity by 2035. Within the developed country, that's the, that's the kind of the, the pathway that the International Energy Agency have been quite clear for for, um, for for developed economies. This momentum that's building, building, building. So from my perspective, um, I, I would love to see how a kind of career developer plan for how it's going to get that, that for focus this is on a, a rapid short-term coal phase out, but or coal power phase out, but also really tries to uh, address gas as well. Coal prices at all-time records at the moment, but the gas price in uh, has, has increased even further um, proportionally. So, um, so gas would definitely need to be addressed, not just from a climate perspective, but also from 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 an economics perspective. And um, and where Korea at the moment has two thirds, almost two thirds of its electricity coming from coal or from gas. There's a real kind of urgency for a plan to uh, to get off that, and 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 that's going to require an awful lot of vision um, from from the leaders in Korea. Thank you, Mr. David Jones. So today's interview, uh, the, we could be more aware and familiar with the global mega trends and evidence-based comparisons in uh, future fit the interventions and the policies the, to lead global society, and including in South Korea. Uh, to be closer to carbon neutrality goal. Uh, so indeed, we are in, the, in need of the knowledge creation and sharing and the behavior change and choice architecture to achieve the carbon neutrality goal. I hope this interview the influence our mind and heart and behavior to improve uh, carbon neutrality actions and achievements. Uh, thank you everyone for watching the interview.